Hi, everyone. It's Grant Abbott speaking from Lightyear Docs, Lightyear Training Group, which is soon to be released, and, of course, Abbott and Morley Lawyers. Today, I'm talking about, look at this, SMSF. This is from my old number plate. How exciting it. And I've still got it. So we're going to be talking about self-managed superannuation funds today uh, rather than succession as a section of state planning. Uh, but what I want to talk about is a really important um, component of estate planning when it comes around to self-managed superannuation funds. Importantly, when we go down and structure these elements, um, uh, accountants can basically do it, financial planners as well. But we need to start to make decisions as to when a client dies, what is the best form? Should it be a lump sum? Should it be a pension that arises from um, like a binding death benefit nomination or SMSF will? Or should we have an auto-reversionary pension? My money always, absolutely always, is in relation to the auto-reversionary pension. So let me show you on our uh, board um, exactly what it looks like. So we're looking at an auto-reversionary pension. Uh, there's a lot of information on this from um, the ATO and certainly a, a number of cases. Let me go through, and it's been around in the system for a long time. You'll find that every public servant has this. If you've got a defined benefit fund, typically, um, you get a pension uh, when you retire, which is usually a, a multiple of um, your final average salary. And then when you pass away, it goes to the spouse, maybe 60% or 70%. So that instantly, the point in time that you pass is money that's being paid next month to the spouse. And the whole thing there is to make sure the family is looked after. And you know my motto. My motto is essentially to ensure that we protect family wealth for the bloodline for multi-generations. The auto reversionary pension does that. The lump sum will never, ever do that. But let me go and show you exactly what to do. So the first thing is that when we do an auto reversionary pension, obviously the first element, and you can do this on the Lightyear Docs platform. Alternatively, we can do it through you uh, for you through our legal back office at Abbott and Morley Lawyers. We set up the pension. The first element is, okay, on the death of the pension member, and this needs to be part of the constituent pension documents, and that's important because once they're laid down, they're part of the governing rules of the fund, which means, in essence, they're not only protected by the CIS Act of Commonwealth law, but there's quite severe penalties, including financial loss and damages if anyone goes against it, and more importantly, it can be criminal penalties as well. So that's why I love dealing with the CIS Act as opposed to, for example, state-based succession laws. Anyway, let's go back. So we build the pension documents through Lightyear Docs, and the first port of call is who's going to get the pension uh, when you pass away. So quite often it's going to be the spouse. Remember like the CSS, the PSS, a lot of defined benefit pensions, and that's fantastic. So let's work our way through. It's just as I said before. When we pass away, if you're an administrator of the account, essentially what you'll do is you'll simply transfer that pension to the spouse next so that the next pension payment effectively will be in the spouse's name. Now, there's a little bit of um, a uh, methodology around that because the spouse may be a different age. They have to take in a proportional minimum amount for them for the rest of the year. Obviously, up to the point in time where the original pension member dies, you're going to have to pay a minimum amount. That will then go to the estate. But from that date onwards, um, essentially, um, the money there will be for the next spouse. The question then is that let's say what happens when that spouse dies. Ordinarily, if you have the most defined benefit pensions, that effectively just is wiped off the mat. So that's the end. And you'll see, for example, in Canberra, a lot of uh, public servants will have a self-managed super fund to look after um, their children, so on and so forth. But if we've got a pension, if we have dependents, um, and a dependent, for example, um, if we have a look at uh, the CIS Act includes spouses. So we can have a, a the end of the spouse, we can have a pension going to um, our children, our adult children. The issue there, though, is under the uh, CIS regulations, uh, 621-2A, unfortunately, pensions can only be payable um, to essentially children over 25, which means that when we have the pension, we go, we go um, the original pension member, we would then go to the, um, uh, the spouse, and then instead of carrying on, what would have to happen is it would come down here and effectively would be commuted. So it still go to the children, um, they come out at the lump sum, and it would be commuted at that point in time. 
If, for example, though, we've gone there and there, and at the time um, of the death of the pension member, which is obviously going to be here, we've got, for example, grandchildren, brothers or sisters who are financially dependent upon that original pension member, then they continue on that pension. That pension is only locked out for children only locked out for children. So if we can show financial dependence, then we potentially can go to gr grandpa, grandma, and then grandchildren, and they can split it jointly and evenly. And this follows a great body of annuity-based law that goes back two to three centuries. So, you know, I really love, um, love that element. So that's the auto reversionary pension. So it just goes on straight away. Importantly, our spouse is not left out of the deal right away. They're gonna get income. And let's face it, in the grieving element, you want that income to continue if that makes sense. Another fairly important point, particularly if there's a family provisions claim where there's a contested will, um, any eligible person, for example, former spouses, uh, children, anyone can contest an amount that's sitting in the estate. Um, in New South Wales, we've got the concept of the notional estate, which can, which has been able to see who it's in its way into a self-managed super fund and attack that super fund. What happens, though, is that can't apply in relation to auto-reversionary pensions because on death, this is no longer forming part of the estate. This actually moves on to the next person. So there's a lot of really great techniques. In fact, I cut my teeth on pensions when I originally started doing superannuation um, at uh, KPMG, and this is about um, what, about 35 years ago. So I know it inside and out, love it to death. Now, let's look at the counter argument, particularly we have a lot of um, legal firms saying that um, auto-reversionary pensions should not um, be automatic, that a uh, binding death benefit nomination or an SMSF will should override. And here's what I'm telling you is probably not the best way, is that when we have a look at um, CIS Regulation 621.2, so CIS Regulation 621.2, it basically says that um, on the death of a member, a pension can be paid, which is fantastic, but we've already got an order of reversionary. We don't have to worry about 621.2. But it says that if you want to pay a lump sum from here, there is only two instances. You can only ever do it twice. So you get two bites of the cherry. That's it. That's it. No, nothing more. So you can offer an interim lump sum, which can be no greater than the member's balance. And you're not going to know what the member's balance is anyway. And you know that from an administration point of view. Once you value everything up, you have to have a look at the deed itself. And, and I'll cover that a little bit later on. But you have to look at the deed itself. Um, and then you, you can pull some money down. And you can pull some money down, absolutely. If you've got a binding death benefit nomination going to the spouse, absolutely, it can go directly to the spouse. What happens if the spouse is not alive? And this is the funny thing, is because most binding death benefit nominations just go to one to each other. But if the spouse is not alive or they both die together, what happens there? The last thing you want is that lump sum to go to the estate because family provisions claims, yo, <laughs> you don't want to get anywhere near that. So what we want to make sure is that um, essentially the, the, that lump sum, we can do an interim and then we can do a final lump sum. But how's the spouse going to live on that period of time? What happens if you are simply poking around the numbers, you make a payment out, um, you know, it goes out directly to the spouse, that's fine. But isn't it better for the spouse to get an ongoing income stream? Which would you prefer, like a salary and wages, or would you like to just have an interim lump sum that your employer pays you at some point down the track? Security, consistency. One of the top values of um, anyone that you know I deal with is one of their top three values of their life right now is to get a secure income stream. Secure income stream, not a secure income stream. And I think that's fairly important. Um, and again, as I said before, there's a whole lot of family provisions um, aims. The goal there should always be it goes here. Worst case scenario, for example, that we don't have, um, we don't want the adults. For example, if it goes to adult children, it should go down to a special purpose SMSF testamentary trust. We call it a death benefits trust. That is created by the trustee of the fund in conjunction with you rather than go to the estate. Why? Because if it goes to the estate, it's subject to a family provisions claims. So that's why I always, um, from my experience around about 35 to 40 years in superannuation law, that's why I always go to order reversionary. It works because it's been there for two to 300 years. Superannuation lump sums, 
is not so much the case. We've only really just come out of defined benefit pensions in the, the last 30 years in Australia. All across the world, this is the way it is because it works. Anyway, this is Grant Abbott. This is one of our first video logs. We call them vlogs. And I just have to show you this again. This is my little SMSF chalk talk. It's Grant Abbott signing off. And if you've got any issues, please contact us at Abbott and Morley or you can go through your Lightyear Doc search. Um, there's plenty of stuff around there. I can show you how to do auto reversionary pensions that go not only one, two, but three levels. We always have to consider what happens if this person is alive, if this person is alive. If you don't do that, then effectively you've got a very poor product. And if we're trying to protect our client's family wealth for their bloodline, then we don't want poor product. We want strategic thinking. And just by the way, um, I've got a uh, I've got a three day pepper course coming up on the eighth of March, the eighth of March. So I'd love you to come there. We'll be looking at a lot of estate planning, a lot of SMSF estate planning, but also looking at why testamentary trusts are quite poor, still useful, but how to build living trusts. Anyway, it's Grant Abbott from AM Lawyers, Lightyear Training Group, Lightyear Docs, signing off.